I'm grateful that he hides my soul in the cleft of the rock this morning. Thank you so much for singing. We really do appreciate that. Thankful for the message of that song. I grew up listening to the artist, Ray Bolts, that wrote that song. And uh, that, was, that was the soundtrack. <laughs> Ray Bolts was part of the soundtrack to our lives. And so when I walked in and heard, that, heard him rehearsing, rehearsing that song this morning, I, I, it took me back. It took me back to, uh, to many, many times whenever we, would, whenever we would listen to the song and know the reality that the anchor held wherever or whatever we were facing. And it holds where you're, what you're facing today as well. He was absolutely right. When the anchor gets down and grips the solid rock, that's, uh, that's a wonderful place to be. There's an old song that says, and that rock is Jesus. He's the one. He's the one this morning. It's been a delight. It's been a real delight to be able to be here to speak to you, and not only to speak to you, but to participate with you. I think I've said this before from this, from this uh, platform, and I'll say it again. It takes real trust for a pastor to allow, uh, it doesn't matter if he's in surgery or not, for him to be comfortable with and allow somebody to come in and fill his pulpit for one week, let alone for five. And here we are on the fifth Sunday, and boy, what a tremendous, what a tremendous honor that it's been for my family and I to be able to minister to you and to be ministered to from you. And you have, you've ministered to our hearts. As I've seen you come in with the confidence that you've had that God's in control and you've slipped into service and you've worshiped and you've, I've listened to you pray and I've watched you give and been encouraged by seeing your confidence in God. It's ministered to our hearts. And we want to say thank you. We, many, several of you have had us in your homes, uh, and we've, got a, we've had a chance to be a part of uh, backyard barbecues, and we've had a chance to stand around a table with Pastor Dan and play Dutch Blitz. And uh, you think my wife's quiet and demure and kind, you get over at Murden Charities and get her playing Dutch Blitz, and you'll see that she'll, she'll just come right out there and start throwing them down. And uh, so I, 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 have, uh, I have been, it's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful time. I had, had an opportunity to be at somebody, uh, somebody else's house this week, uh, this last week, and enjoy uh, just a wonderful, wonderful meal. And we sat around and we sat around until I looked at my wife and I said, I think we're wearing out, <laughs> we're wearing out our welcome here. And we weren't, they were, they were, they're kind hosts and we want you to know how appreciative we've been of you and your family, your families ministering to our hearts this this last month and really a month and a week and uh, we want you to know it's been a wonderful privilege you have a wonderful church you have a wonderful church i hope you don't ever don't ever look down on what god has given you don't ever look down on what god's god's given you a wonderful church a wonderful opportunity to minister to a lost and dying world and i appreciate that it's also good to have my parents in church this morning and uh turnabout is fair play you ever heard that little statement turnabout is fair play when i was 17, 18, 19 years old, I wanted to try out a bunch of different churches. And my mom and dad said, if you're staying in my house, you're going to my church. <laughs> I didn't have to say it, but I would have. I said, if you're staying in my house, which they are, they're down visiting. <laughs> you're going to go with, to my church. And this is my church this morning. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have them here. And uh, missionaries for many, many years and involved in missions still today. And we really, really, I really want you to know, I have greatest confidence in the world in humans, those two humans sitting right there. They're spiritual role models to me. And uh, I appreciate them. Appreciate their commitment to having me in church. I told somebody this week, I said, I grew up with a drug problem. Every time the doors were open, they drug me to church. I just said, you gotta go, you gotta go. It doesn't matter if it's Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival, you gotta go, you gotta be there. And, uh, but that's given me a love for the people of God. That's given me a love for the Word of God. And uh, that's given me a love for the ministry that God has to people through the avenue of gathering together. And so, boy, again, what a wonderful privilege to be able to be here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn in them to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 22. The book of Luke chapter 22. I want to just read while you're finding Luke 22. You will be, we'll be picking up around verse 28 but let me read the kind of the background jesus has gone through his earthly ministry and he's come down to the end and he comes to that iconic moment when he gathers the, the disciples with him in the upper room and he breaks the bread in front of them in the cup and he says verse 14 says this when the hour had come he sat down with the 12 disciples and he said to them 
This fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will no longer eat of this until, I, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said unto you, divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until God comes. And then he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which was broken for you in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after, uh, took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. But behold, the hands of my betrayer is with me on the table. And verse 22 gives those sad words in the midst of this beautiful statement. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined by the woe of the man by whom he is being betrayed. Verse 23 says, Then they begin to question themselves which among them would do this thing. Then they did something really ridiculous. Jesus over and over again had said, I'm not living for this world. I'm living for the next one. I'm not here to set up an earthly kingdom. I'm here to present to you what a heavenly kingdom looks like. I'm not here to be your Messiah in the sense of setting myself up as a king and stamping out Roman rule. I'm here to show you that I'm here to be the sinless, sac the sinless sacrifice, the propitiation, King James says. That's that $10 word. I'm here to be the sinless sacrifice for you. But the disciples couldn't see it. It just, it just seemed like it just got to their, their forehead and just kind of bounced off. And you see it again in verse 24. They begin to dispute about who's going to be the greatest in this. They're missing this beautiful metaphor where Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood that's been shed for you. I, and I'm not going to do this again with you. Jesus said, I'm not going to do this again with you until I do it at the new, in the new Jerusalem. I'm looking forward to that day, by the way. But then Jesus looks at them and he says this. And, you know, Jesus kind of puts himself in a little bit of a predicament. And you begin to wonder, you begin to realize why the disciples feel the way they felt. Why the disciples did jockey for positions. Why the disciples did worry about who was going to be greatest in his kingdom. Because Jesus said the things that he said here. Here's what he said. Let me, let me, my page turned in the wind here. Verse 24, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. And Jesus said to them, The king of the Gentiles exercises lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be, the, uh, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, who sits at the table or who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But then he says this, and this is why the disciples had to be confused because Jesus puts, puts a ton of stock in them. He, he tells them, he kind of opens, opens the door and lets them look through to see the future. He said this, verse 28, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom. Just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, whether or not the disciples still picked up on the metaphor or not, whether or not they still, whether or not they, they were, were foggy and thought that he was still talking about an earthly kingdom or they realized that he was talking about a heavenly kingdom, the point was very clear. Jesus looked at them and said, you come along with me. You've walked with me. You've continued in my trials. And therefore, I see extreme value in you. And I'm going to make you into somebody because of who you are. I'm going to make you someone great. I'm going to set you in a place of prominence. I'm going to give you the right and the, and the privilege of ruling over the entire 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to sit with me. In my kingdom, talking about glory. The president of the Bible college I attended, Pastor Downing would know him well, S.D. Heron, the founder of the Bible college that I attended, would speak to people, and when he talked, especially when he talked to young people, he would ask them to write in the flyleaf of their Bible. Now, I know several of you brought your Bibles into church today, a, a, a hard copy of your Bible. Some, I've talked to, you some, uh, to some of you about your Bibles. 
Now, how many of you write in the flyleaf for your Bible? Does anybody write in the flyleaf for your Bible? Absolutely, I do, because it's a great place to keep content. If you hear something that's challenging or valuable, and S.D. Heron would say to young people, he'd say, listen, I'm going to give you permission to write in your Bible tonight. I want you to write these two statements in your Bible. And I want, you don't have to write them in your Bible today, but I would challenge you and encourage you, encourage you to put these two statements in a place where you keep sacred truth. Here were the two statements that young, that S.D. Heron would say to young people. He would say this. He would say, I want you to remember this. I want you to say this with me. I am valuable. And I'd like you to say that with me this morning. I am valuable. Do you believe that this morning? Here's the second statement that S.D. Heron would say. He would say this. He would say, I want you to also say this. I am vulnerable. Say that with me. I am valuable, I am vulnerable. S.D. Herring realized after years and years and years of ministry that you can plumb the depths of Scripture, you can talk about the deepest realities of the gospel, you can jump into all these theological contexts, but at the end of the day, you have to connect with people right where they are, and here's where they're living. He wanted to remind them, and I want to remind you this morning, that you are valuable. And you are vulnerable. What does it mean to be vulnerable? What, is, what does the word vulnerable mean? That's a kind of a, that's kind of maybe not a $10 word, but it's kind of like a nine and a half dollar word. Right? We don't usually necessarily use those words vulnerable very much, right? If my daughter came up to me, she's four, and she said, Daddy, I'm feeling really vulnerable. I would be more proud about her diction and her ability, her vocabulary, than I would be about what's going on in her world at that point. What does it mean to be vulnerable? Here's what the definition of vulnerable. Vulnerable, says, vulnerable means that you're susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm. You're susceptible to physical attack, emotional attack, you're susceptible, or you're in need of special care, support, or protection because of your age, disability, or risk of abuse and neglect. That's straight out of the dictionary. You're susceptible to attack or in need of special care. I am valuable. I am vulnerable. I'm not going to ask how many of you have a Netflix account. <laughs> But how many of you have ever jumped on Netflix or YouTube and the next thing you know, it seems like an hour has passed, right? Yeah, there's a bunch of you, yeah, you're just like me. Sometimes it seems like even longer has passed because it has passed. And the other day I was, I was watching, I forget whether it was Netflix or Prime or something like that, I, I, I jumped on Pastor Dan, I, I really like history, I like to be, I like to be a student of history and, and really enjoy uh, reading about leaders that have, have done amazing things in history. And I found a documentary about someone with a famous hat. Now, one of the things that caught, me, that caught my attention about this documentary was this person's hat. This person's hat became part of his mystique. Just like Winston Churchill smoked cigars, and you could, any picture you see of Winston Churchill, most likely is going to be he, in or around, he's going to be smoking a cigar. This person was famously tied to the hat that he wore. And so I sat down and over a series of evenings, I began to watch this documentary about this world leader and begin to, and just again, as I watched this, watched this documentary, I began to realize this person was famous, not only for his hat, but he was famous for a lot of the things that he did. Maybe you can think about who I'm talking about. This, this person was famous for a pose in all of the paintings. So this, you know, it was before photography in all the paintings, he was a very, very well-dressed gentleman In all of the paintings, he would stand there with his hand or many of the paintings, he would stand there with his hand in his jacket. Anybody know who I'm, don't yell it out. Does anybody know who I'm talking about yet? Yeah, there's a few people. Okay, there's one person. That, yeah, he was, he, was, he was a person who rose from obscurity in a, as a low-ranking soldier and ended up taking over the majority of the known world at the time. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Okay. He got caught up. And when he lost, when he ended up losing, he got caught up and was banished to an island for, to, to repay for his crimes. The island, and I'll give it to you, the island of Elba. 
Anybody know who I'm talking about? He's, he was a little short man, little, kind, of, kind of like Bumpy, just real kind of short and just kind of, <laughs> kind of had, this, and had this big attitude, kind of like Bumpy. Just, you know. <laughs> we, had, we had a great time playing Dutch Blitz with him the other night. Had this big, he, in fact, he had, he had such a big attitude that there is actually a psychological name for a complex that people have based around this guy's name. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. He is most famous, even though he took over the majority of the world at, at the time, he is most famous not for his victories, but for what? For his defeat. His defeat. Who am I talking about? Say it with me. Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah. Most famous for his defeat. And I thought about his hat as I watched this video because I really like hats. I have a big collection of hats. And I, and I, and I, I just kept looking at the hat and said, wow, that's really, really interesting. I wonder if his hat is still in existence. And so, of course, I went to the place where all truth is found, not the Bible, Google, right? <laughs> Googled it and said, you know, of course. And I found out that Napoleon, there's actually a number of his hats that are still in existence. And I began to do the research to find out where his hats were and what they were being sold for. And I realized, Pastor Dan, that there's this, there were several of these hats out here that were in incredible, some of them were in incredible condition, and some of them were in really, really poor condition. The one hat that I found a video of, is, it, was, it was a hat that's in a hat box, and you know what I'm talking about. It's that big hat that starts over here, starts small like this, and then it goes way up right here at the top. It seemed to make Napoleon taller than he really was. Had the big rosette flower right here up in the corner and the little tassel. And the little button right here, made out of a beaver felt skin combination, black. When he stood there with his, and, and normally people wore them long ways like this. Napoleon purposely wore his sideways like this so everybody could see his silhouette coming down the road. And I found that there's hats. These hats are still in existence. I found this picture of this beautiful hat box. And I say beautiful, it was it was interesting anyway, maybe that's the way I should put it, this, this hat box that they had, and it was sitting in this, in this clean room, all white room, it was sitting there, and pr people had put it on beautiful white gloves, nice careful white gloves, and had reached into this case, this glass case, this airtight case, had reached in to take out this hat, and as they pulled it out, I was shocked to notice that that hat was in terrible condition. Terrible. That hat was torn up here in the corner. The fact that it had been rained on in the, 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 the fact that it had been rained on uh, caused the one side of it to be dilapidated. The rosette up in the top corner of that hat was completely gone and the tassel was frayed and the button was losing its stitching. One of the things about Napoleon was he never, he didn't like to use a sweatband in his hat so he'd have them take out the sweatband. And so the front of that hat was eaten away by the sweat of, had been eaten away by the sweat of his brow and you could see that hat was deteriorating all across this front line. That hat was falling apart but yet here people were taking that hat out of an airtight case and putting it in that hat box and taking that hat box and putting it down in, a, in an armored box and packing that up for shipping to send it off. To Paris, France. That hat sold at an auction. Anybody want to guess what a Korean businessman paid for it? Two point five million dollars for a junky old hat. That hat was extremely, extremely valuable. Because it was vulnerable. That hat was extremely valuable because it was just one of a few that was like it. It was one of a few hats that was like it. And they weren't going to make any more. No, there will be no more hats that Napoleon's going to wear. Trust me. He's gone. And the only thing we have left, well, one of the things we have left is that particular hat. What made that hat special was that was the hat that he wore at the Battle of Waterloo. And it says that he left the field so fast that a Dutch dragoon rode in on his horse and scooped that hat up with his sword. And so that hat is storied. It's beautiful. It's extremely valuable. $2.5 million. It's extremely valuable because it is Vulnerable. Do you understand what I'm saying here this morning? It's valuable because of the fact that they're not making any more of them. It's valuable because of the fact that it, it could fall apart at any minute. 
Maybe you don't care about Napoleon. Maybe you say, well, I want to know something about America. If you go, to the, if you go down to Washington, D.C., and you go into the, na- the National Archives and Records, it's kind of a nondescript name, but the, the founding document of the United States is in the National Archives and Records. I've been there. I've seen it myself. Inside, underneath three layers of glass, in a machine billeted out of one solid piece of aluminum, and, and, and uh, protected by a layer of vacuumless argon gas, is the Declaration of Independence. When you walk in, they tell you no photography. Over the years, people have taken pictures of that Declaration of Independence, and the photography has wore down the molecules in the Declaration, and so no flash photography. In fact, I don't even think you're allowed to take photography at all, if I remember correctly. And you walk into a room, not like this room, it's a small room, and and, and you walk into this rotunda, and right up in the center, there are other documents surrounding it, and they're under protected glass, but right in the center is this gigantic piece of glass, and you walk up to it, and it looks like like you're in the middle of a vault, and the the lighting is uh, very, very dimly lit in that room, and you have to kind of lean in to be able to see the founding document of the United States. It's extremely valuable, because it's extremely valuable vulnerable. There are things that are valuable because they are vulnerable. There are things that are vulnerable, susceptible to attack, in need of special care because they are valuable. I just read an article not too long ago about the Vatican, and and they said that there, there was something happening in the Vatican that hadn't happened for several hundred years. They were removing a set of wooden steps from the Vatican, and underneath those wooden steps were a set of marble steps that that wooden steps were set three, that, were, that were built there to cover. And what they said was, you're going to have an opportunity, a really a once in a lifetime, lifetime opportunity to be able to climb these marble steps. And remember, marble is stone, right? And what was so significant about these, what was so valuable about these particular steps is they are said by, Catholic, by the Catholic religion, they are said by Catholic lore to be the steps that Jesus himself climbed on his way to be tried by Pontius Pilate. And so, and so in fact, they, over the, uh, down through the years, they would actually, it said that Jesus sweat drops of blood or blood drops of blood on these steps and they've marked those, where those drops of blood have hit by uh, brass rosettes that are put down into those steps. You can see them. You look this up. You'll see what I'm talking about. But over the years, people have come. They've made major pilgrimages to the Vatican for hundreds of years. They made major pilgrimages to the Vatican, and they would come up to those marble steps, and they would get down on their knees and rub the place where Jesus' blood drops were said to have fallen. They would get down on their knees and climb the steps and stop and kiss the steps on the way up to the top. So much so that human, the human body, as soft as it is, is wore down major grooves in the edge of those steps. And the steps that were supposed to be perfect right angles have now been worn to, to curbs. And the Vatican came along and built a set, of, a set of wooden steps over top of those steps to cover them. Why? Those steps, even, as, even though the fact that they were stone, were extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable to humans over time would have worn them down to nothing. If the Vatican let them. And the reality was they were uncovering them and saying, we're going to re- be actually rebuilding a set of steps here. But for a brief time, you as a, as a Catholic can make a pilgrimage and climb these steps. You're not going to want to miss this. You see, what made those steps very, very val- uh, uh, vulnerable was the fact that they were valuable. To somebody, they meant something. And so they would go and climb those steps. You think about the fact that Something is vulnerable because it's valuable. You think about endangered species. You think about the skins of animals, ivory tusks. You think about these things. These animals, we, t- we say, we, s- we actually write laws in this country that say these animals, we know that they're vulnerable because they're extremely valuable. S.D. Heron knew exactly what he, was ta- what he was talking about when he talked to people and he looked at them and he said, I want you to know something. You are valuable. But he also knew something when he looked at him and said, you know what, I want you also to know that you are vulnerable as well. Scripture is replete with examples of this very thing. You look at Scripture and you'll see a number of people that had extreme value. They, they, they're people that we all know added major value in their situation. David was valuable because of the talent that he had. 
his willingness to be a part of what was going on. You remember the story of the giant. David comes up on a camp full of, full of Israelites, cowering in fear at Goliath and says, listen, why in the world are we letting this person talk to us about who our God is? We need to stand up and do something. And the next thing you know, you see all these, these, these seasoned warriors pushing David in front of Saul and saying, hey, this guy's willing to do something. This guy has, this guy has some willingness and he has, he has some basic ability. And Saul says, really, tell me about it. David said, well, there was a bear and a lion and I had a sling. And God made the difference. David was extremely valuable because of his training. God, God sheltered him for years and years and years out in the field in, as a shepherd, helped him to realize what it meant to shepherd sheep and then turned around and made him king over all of Israel. David had been trained. David was a person of tenacity. He was a person that hung on, that stayed through the thick of the... And that made David extremely valuable. You think of the story of Esther... For those, you, 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 those of you young ladies, I want you to know something. Esther was beautiful. There's no two ways about it. The Bible says very clearly that she was beautiful, that she was wholesome. She, was, she had a winsomeness about her that separated her out from all the other girls. And when King Ahasuerus saw her, he said, wow, that's amazing. You, you are a kind individual. You are a person who's, who's charming. And I want you, out of all these other women, I want you to be the queen. Esther had a beautiful deportment. She had a beautiful way about her. She was, she was someone that people were attracted to. I think of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This was the, the modern day, that, the modern uh, example. This was, a, this was an ancient example of a modern practice of espionage. When the, when, when, the, when the Persians would come into a place, what they would do in order to wipe a, a civilization out is they would burn and kill all the blue-collar people and burn their houses, burn their city, raise plow up their streets, make sure that there was nothing left. And then they would take all the intelligentsia, all the people of the day who had a name and who had a background and who had an education, they would gather them all together and they would carry them off to their place of residence. And what they would do is then they would begin to indoctrinate them and, and, and inculcate them into their culture and their process and their way of living until at least if not in that generation and subsequent generations, the, the, the intelligentsia would think like Persians. They would act like the Persians. They would give away the secrets of the home country. It was espionage at its finest. And the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, sometimes we think that they were just kind of three bumpkins running around in Persia. No, these were people that were, that were extremely valuable because they came from wonderful, good families. They came from families that, were, that had names, families that had training, families that were part of a heritage of Judaism, part of a heritage of, of, of culture. These were young men who had major intelligence on their side. They were smart. They, were, they, were, they knew trade secrets. They knew what was going on. These men were extremely valuable. And I'm looking at a room full of people this morning that if I could sit down and know your story, I could begin to find out where you are valuable because of your talent because of your ability, because of your willingness, because of your want to, because of, your, of, because of a desire that you have to serve and love people, because of the fact that people can count on you to step into a role. I'm looking at people this morning who are valuable because of your winsomeness and beauty. People are genuinely attracted to you. People genuinely want to be around, just like Esther, people genuinely want to be around you. They find themselves drawn to you, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm seeing people this morning that are valuable for that very reason. Don't shy away from it, it's okay. You're valuable this morning. I'm looking at people this morning that are valuable because of the training that you've had. Because of the upbringing that you've had, godly parents in your, in your life, people that have given you something that, that, is a, that is a priceless treasure this morning. The word of God has been planted in your heart, or maybe you've purposely planted, you've hidden the word of God in your heart, and, and, and you know what it means to talk to people, and you know what it means to share the love of God, and you, you people are drawn to you because you this morning are valuable. You may say, well, I don't see very much value in myself. You come hang out with me for five minutes, and I begin to ask you questions. I can begin to point out the value. Trust me, 
In, 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 in so many ways, we oftentimes don't see the value in ourselves, but I want you to know something. Everybody else does. Everybody else does. And if you'll make yourself available to people, if you'll make, especially to a, a church like this one, if you'll make yourself available and say, I, I don't know what I'm good at, but Mr. Lilly, I want to volunteer for something. David will find a place to put you to work. He will. Pastor, Pastor uh, Dan Downing will find a place to make sure that you're plugged in. Why? Because you are valuable. You have something to offer. You have something to give. I want you to know that I believe that with all of my heart. There's not one person in here that gets to slide by and say, well, I don't matter. You do matter. Not just to this church. You matter to the kingdom of God. You matter to, his, you matter to, to, to the advancement of the kingdom of God. Jesus, Jesus didn't say, listen, I'm going to put you disciples over here in a corner and whatever you can make happen, you make happen and I'm going to be over here and I'm going to build my church. No, Jesus looked right at Peter and he said, I'm going to build my church through you. He looked at his disciples and he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the gospel, you the keys of the kingdom. It's the gospel and love and peace and joy and contentment is going to come through you. You're valuable this morning. But the very things that made the Hebrew, that made these people valuable are the things that made them vulnerable. David, in all of his value, in all of his talent and willingness and ability, was vulnerable to the attacks. Vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Vulnerable to leadership pressure. Saul saying, why don't you put on my armor? Valuable to, or he was vulnerable to, he was, he was susceptible to the, the attacks of his brothers saying, listen, you're not good enough. Stay in the background. He was susceptible to the, to the treachery of his own son, Absalom. He was susceptible to his own whims and ways. You see, the, you see the book of Psalms is just David's one depressing, where it seems like one swinging from one high to one low to one high. The thing that made David so valuable was the very thing that made him vulnerable. The very thing that made Esther so valuable was her winsomeness and her beauty and her talent and her wholesomeness. That was the very thing that made her vulnerable. It was the very idea that she had been brought into the palace and that all that charm was something that drew her in and all of a sudden Haman said, listen, I don't want to have anything to do with it and I'm going to go right through, I'm going to go right through this particular family and I'm going to take out, and he didn't even know he was working at taking out the queen herself. The three Hubert children with their training and their heritage, their intelligentsia and their family name were susceptible. You, you see it. Bel, Belshazzar called them in all and said, listen, I want you, with all of your intelligence, I want you to begin to take on our culture, eat our food, drink our wine, do what we do. I, that's the rule of the day. And the three Hebrew children had to stand up and they had to make a choice because the thing that made them so valuable was the thing that made them vulnerable. We read this passage of scripture in, in Luke chapter 22 where Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, listen, he said, I want you to know something. You're valuable. You're valuable. I'm going to make you kings. I'm going to make you rulers. I'm going to make you leaders. I'm going, to, I'm going to do something with you that people are going to stand back in absolute amazement. But then he says this famous passage, the next verse over, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Then he said that Jesus looked at Simon and he said, Simon, Simon, hey, hey, Simon, listen to me closely. Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Jesus knew about Simon what he knows about every single one of us. That he, he knows that he's placed extreme value on your life. He knows that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. He knows that your life is valuable to him. He's sacrificed everything. Scripture says he suffered without the gate that he would sanctify, draw, make sure that every believer is his own. Made in his image, identifying with him. You are valuable this morning. But Jesus knew that the very thing that makes you valuable, the talent and the ability that you have, the love for people that you have, your willingness to serve, your abilities, he, the very, he knew the very thing that makes you valuable this morning is the very thing that makes you vulnerable. And he said to Simon, he said, hey, 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 focus on me for just a second. I want you to know something. There is a real devil out there that wants to sift you as a wheat. You know what sifting is? Sifting is a natural process that we, I'm sure Pastor Dan has told you before, and for, but for the sake of the message, I'll say it again. Sifting is a natural process where we separate what is good from what is bad. 
where we take shafts of wheat and gather them all together and bring them on the threshing floor, and you lay those shafts of wheat out on the threshing floor, and now we have machines and all to do all this today, but back in those days, they would lay those in a big pile, and then they would take out a long club or a long stick and begin to beat those shafts of wheat and smack those shafts of wheat and smash those shafts of wheat until the, until the breakdown of the fibers, until everything began to fall apart. It was a crushing process. They would step on and stomp on and move and smash until, until everything in that wheat was broke down into little tiny fibers. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Satan's desire to have you that he may sift you as wheat. There are some of you this morning that don't feel very valuable this morning because of the fact that you're in this process right here. Because you're in the, in the process where you feel like the devil's got you and he's, he's thrown you down and thrown one thing on, on top, or one thing after another on top of you and he is just beating you down. Jesus said to Peter, he said, I want you to know something. You are extremely valuable and what makes you valuable is the fact, is the th- very thing that makes you vulnerable. The devil wants to sift you. Scripture is very clear that we, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the air. And, 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 uh, principalities, powers of the air, and, and those who work divinations and iniquity in this world. And the very reality is that you may find yourself being beat down this morning. You may find yourself being crushed this morning. You may find yourself being broken this morning. And that that may be the very reason why you don't feel very valuable. But let me say something that that helps me realize that you're vulnerable this morning. But the very thing that makes you vulnerable is what makes you valuable. In a sifting process, they scoop up what's left of that broken wheat and they throw it up in the air. Throw it up in the air and and the wind comes and pushes the chaff away. And what's, what's good solid wheat falls back down into the pile. They scoop it up and put it in a basket and throw it in the air. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, there's people this morning under the sound of my voice that are going through the process where they've been, you've been pushed into a pile and you feel like you've been beaten down and you, you feel like you've been, you've been hurt and you feel like you've been damaged and you, you feel like you've been broken this morning and you feel like there's major pressure going on in your world. You feel like life just seems to grab you in the middle of all the circumstances of going on in the world and it seems to throw you up in the air. Situations come along and it seems to scoop you up and next thing you know you're flying up in the air Next thing you know your world seems like it's weightless and seems like things are in major flux this morning You're you're vulnerable this morning But the reality is what makes you vulnerable ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you makes you valuable this morning Jesus looked at Peter and he said, listen, I want you to know something. I'm gonna, you're extremely valuable to me. I'm going to make you a king. I'm going to make you a ruler. I'm going to make you into who I want you to be. I've got a plan for your life. But that value means that you're vulnerable this morning. Satan's coming after you. But then Jesus says this, the very thing that makes you vulnerable to Satan is what makes you valuable to me. Jesus said this, He said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I've prayed for you. This morning I realized that I'm talking to a crowd of people that have a whole future out in front of them as a church. I'm talking about two people who are who are leading your family and trying to do what God wants you to do in the middle of your, and you've got a whole future out in front of you as a family. I realize I'm talking to a a crowd of people that if I were to find you in your element and see what God's doing with you, I would see a person who's talented, who has all the wonderful abilities to to love and care for people, all the wonderful abilities to, to, to organize and put things together. And you're valuable. You're valuable to this church. You're valuable to the family that you're a part of. You're valuable to the family of God, this part of the family of God that he's placed you in. Don't ever forget that. That makes you vulnerable this morning to the attacks of the enemy, and he's going to. But I want you to know that Jesus slips in just like he slipped into Peter, and he says, hey, listen, I know that Satan's going to desire to beat you down. Satan's going to desire to put you through the ringer, but I want you to know something. I am praying for you. Can you imagine can you imagine the divine king of the entire universe 
who stepped down out of heaven, was born as a babe in the manger. Scripture says, Hebrews says that he did that. It says that he grew up and he went through the growing up process. He went through the young adult process. He went through the, he went through the, uh, the older adult process. Scripture says he did that so that he could identify with you and you and you and you. He did that so he could be touched with the feelings of your infirmities, touched with the feelings of your hurt and pain, touched with the feelings of being broken and beat down and hurt and tossed up in the air. He did that so he could identify with you. And then went a step further to hang on a cruel cross to be able to say, I know what it's like to suffer torture of the cruelest kind. All to be able to provide that sacrifice and then to come back and look you in the eye and say, listen, I've been through what you've been through. I've been through what you've, I've, I've been in the garden. I've been on the mountaintop when the devil said, see all, you can have all of this. I've been when the, here when the devil said, turn these stones into bread. Prove to people that you really are who you say you are. I've been in, under the crushing blow of temptation. I've been under the crushing blow of accusation. I've been under the crushing blow of doubt. I've been there so that I can identify with you. And I want you to know something. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Scripture says that, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father this morning. And he is lifting your name to God himself. He's lifting your name this morning to God himself. And that's why Jesus said, Peter, hey, listen, listen, listen. You're, you're really important. You're valuable. But this morning, I want you to know that, valuable, that value is, is what makes you so vulnerable. But I want you to know that I see that value. And I'm praying for you. I care about you. I want to see God work in tremendous ways in your life. And this morning, I'm looking at a congregation of people that, are want, that, that I want to see walk out of these doors. And walk into Davidson County. Walk into the Guilford County, walk into the counties that you're a part of, walk into the counties and into the places of business and into the homes of people and then back into your family's life. And I want to see you make a tremendous difference. Now, I'll be praying for you. But more than that, I want you to know that Jesus himself carries your name before the Father. When it was all said and done, Job was in the middle of all the difficult circumstances he was in. Job chapter 22 says this. Job said, he said, he, he, you find Job after his wife, has, his wife has told him to curse God and die after his friends, his so-called friends have been there and put the major pressure on him to give up. And, and after Job has had one consult, consultation with God after another, and God really doesn't give him a whole lot of answers. We see Job chapter 22, we see Job just sitting there in almost complete despair saying, you know, I look on my left hand, I don't see you, God. I, I look on my right hand, I, I don't see you, God. I look in front of me and behind me, you're not there. I look above me and below me and I don't see you anywhere. But then Job says this, it says, but you know the way that I take. You know the way that I take. You know the path that I'm walking on. You know where I've been beaten down. You know where I've been under major pressure. You know where I've been broken. And when I'm tried, when I'm tried, when I'm tested, I'll come forth as gold. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not see God anywhere in your life. You may be in this process right here. I want you to know something. The God who sees your vulnerability and the God who sees your value is the God who's praying for you this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help these your people as we walk out of these doors, Lord, into a lost and a dying world, Lord, to realize what a tremendous value that they add to this church. What a tremendous value they add to their families around them. Lord, what a difference that they make. Lord, I pray that you would challenge their hearts with the reality that Satan is real. The devil is real. Hell is real. The, that in an eternity without God is real. And Lord, the devil and the workers of darkness are trying to do their best to take everyone that they can with them. But Lord, you said that you would, in the middle of dark, difficult circumstances, when the devil would come in like a flood, you would lift up a standard against him. Lord, we've heard about the fact that that's a standard of prayer 
Lord, not our prayer, but your prayer where you're interceding on us, uh, for us day and night before the Father. Lord, I pray that you would touch us, walk with us, Lord, as we go out of this place, recognizing that you, Lord, are going with us through the avenue of prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Again, thank you for being here. Don't forget, you can exit out these doors in the back, off to the side. Or over here, Pastor Dan just slipped out that way. And so if you want to say hello to him, I would encourage you to do that. Thank you so much for allowing us to be at Heath Church. And we appreciate your presence here this morning.